I am Valentin Fuster from New York. I am the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, or JAC. And it's a pleasure today to be actually chairing a very interesting, I wouldn't call symposium at this time, but the presentation of a patient. A fascinating case, and we like to entitle Sudden Respiratory Distress in Pregnancy. I have a group of specialists here, uh, which uh, I think will be a very dynamic discussion. And I want to start introducing Dr. Angela Bianco, uh, who is the Systems Director of Maternal Fetal Medicine in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology here at Mount Sinai Health System. She's going to be on a tape later on, is not with us uh, in vivo right now. And then the second person I want to introduce is my great friend, Dr. Chandra Shaker. He's the editor in chief of Jack Cardiovascular Imaging and professor of cardiology at the University of Minnesota and chief of cardiology at the Minneapolis VA Hospital. Then we have Dr. Julia Grabse. I think Julia today is, is here with us from Greece, actually, and she's the editor in chief of the General of the American College of Cardiology Case Reports and associate professor at King's College in London. Then we have Dr. Uh, Robert Lockstein. He has fantastic hands to do procedures, as you will see. He is the executive vice chair of the Department of Diagnostic uh, uh, Molecular and Interventional Radiology, also at Mount Sinai. And then we have Dr. Gregory Serrao, is director of mechanical circulatory support for the cardiac catheterization laboratory also at Mount Sinai. And finally, we have Dr. Homan Poor, who is going to present the case. He's a pulmonologist, a specialist, and he's an assistant professor of medicine here at Mount Sinai. So welcome to all of you. I think it's a fascinating case, and we are ready to move on. So Homan, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Fuster. And we will begin the case. This is a case of a 37-year-old woman, G1P0, 39 weeks and four days, who was undergoing induction of labor with oxytocin. Her past medical history was um, notable for two spontaneous pneumothoraces in the seven years prior. She had underwent a VATS bolectomy with mechanical and talc pleurodesis. 16 hours into labor, the patient developed acute dyspnea and palpitations. Her oxygen saturation was 88% breathing room air, and she was placed on 100% non-rebreather mask. A rapid response team was called at that time. On exam, her blood pressure was 116 over 68. She was tachycardic with a heart rate of 151. Her oxygen saturation was 99% breathing 100% non-rebreather mask. She was visibly tachypnic and anxious, but she could speak full sentences. Her heart exam was tachycardic, but regular. Her lungs were clear bilaterally. Her abdomen was gravid, but non-tender. Her extremities were, were cool, and she had some trace edema bilaterally. Notably, uh, she said that this does not feel like when I had a pneumothorax. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a very interesting presentation, actually dramatic, I would say, in the latest stages of pregnancy. So I would like now to uh, see the echocardiogram and I'm going to ask Julia to see what she thinks. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuster. So on the left side of the screen, we have the apical four chamber view. And the first thing that we notice is that the left ventricle, which is on the right is of normal shape, normal function, but the right side of the heart, the right ventricle and the right atrium are both dilated. So practically, we see that the right ventricle is almost double the size from the, when compared to the left ventricle. And also on the right side of the screen, we have the parasternal short axis. That again, we see that the left ventricle, which is on the bottom of the picture, is, is in normal shape. And there is the characteristic D shape in both end diastole and systole that tell us that we have acute pressure overload. So the right heart is dilated. And what we can see from these images is that we have a state of acute pressure overload. Uh, can I ask you, uh, 
why not a volume overload? You will say, why he's asking this? But I like to, to understand why you say a pressure overload. So for example, characteristic difference is that when we have in both end systole and end diastole the D shape of uh, the left ventricle and we see such pressures that they move the interventricular septum to the left, then we say that we have pressure overload rather than volume overload. And also we have significant reduction of RV function. This is something that I didn't mention before, so I mentioned now. So there is at least moderate to severe RV dysfunction which is also a characteristic of uh, pressure overload. If we had, of course, uh, if we could see better the RV apex from the four apical chamber view, maybe we could see the McConnell sign, which is typical that the right ventricular apex is more vigorous when the rest of the, the ventricle is actually stunned and hypokinetic. But let's see what happens next. Uh, excuse me, can I ask you the last question? Now you see this picture. You say you have a woman in the latest stages of pregnancy in big trouble, as it has been very well presented by human. What comes in your mind? What is what is your thinking? So at the top list of my differential diagnosis will be acute pulmonary embolism. Then I would, of course, have to think about peripartum cardiomyopathy or, of course, right ventricular ischemia. So like first would be P and then second cardiomyopathy or, or uh, the patient suffering ischemia, depending on the risk factors, of course. Okay, thank you very much. Human, why we don't continue with the case? Okay, so the case is continued. Uh, a lung ultrasound was done to evaluate for pneumothorax, which demonstrated bilateral lung sliding, essentially ruling out pneumothorax. Uh, as was discussed, the uh, echocardiogram uh, demonstrated concern for right ventricular dilation and dysfunction. And so given that there was a concern for acute pulmonary embolism, the team requested a CT angiogram of the chest for confirmation. However, the OB at the time said, there is no time for a CTA. She is nine centimeters dilated and needs to deliver within an hour. Well, uh, I think uh, Dr. Angela Bianco is not with us today, but we have a tape in which we have a number of questions. You know, here's the first question. What are the implications of acute pulmonary embolism during fetal delivery? So there's a concern for an acute pulmonary embolism. The team that is managing the patient requests a CT angiogram of the chest to confirm their clinical suspicion. However, upon further discussion with the OB team, there is um, a recommendation not to move the patient off of the labor floor because there's no time to perform um, a CT angiogram of the chest because she is in advanced labor, nine centimeters dilated, and will be delivering in a short period of time. And they really cannot risk transferring her away from um, access to um, services. So the question really becomes when there is a strong clinical suspicion for an acute pulmonary embolism intrapartum in labor, how do we uh, most safely and effectively manage the patient as well as the fetus? Um, and really depends on the stage of labor that a woman is in and her parity. So there, depending on how far along the patient is in the labor, we need to make a determination. Is, is a vaginal delivery um, going to be imminent or will the patient require a cesarean? Um, so if somebody is in advanced labor and an operative vaginal delivery is possible, then one could consider, as is the case here, to have a multidisciplinary approach and deliver the patient um, safely by performing an operative vaginal delivery. The reason for doing an operative delivery is it shortens the second stage of labor, um, but it's important to have all the appropriate resources available, including um, cardiology, invasive cardiology, and CT surgery. So one should consider cannulation of the patient for possible ECMO, and then operative vaginal delivery um, most um, safely performed in the cardiac OR. 
we chose that option for this patient because again, she was very advanced. However, had this diagnosis been suspected much earlier in labor, then a vaginal delivery would be very remote, potentially hours away, and a cesarean delivery would have been the most prudent option to um, expeditiously deliver the fetus to allow for appropriate um, therapy um, acutely for the mother. Um, in that case, one would again cannulate the patient for the potential for ECMO and then perform cesarean in the cardiac um, setting in a cardiac OR. Of course, there um, are many, many decisions to be made about anesthetic modalities and the impact of potentially general anesthesia in the um, context of uh, extreme right-sided heart pressures. Um, but forming an expeditious, performing an expeditious delivery allows for definitive therapy of the mother, which obviously could include therapeutic anticoagulation, potential thromboembolectomy, um, interventional radiologic procedures um, will be discussed in a short while, um, and then uh, potentially uh, definitive, um, more definitive um, surgical management. Um, but again, in this case, given the fact that she was um, in the late stages of labor, it was, um, it, we were able to perform an operative vaginal delivery, cannulate the patient prior to performing that, and then start immediate therapeutic anticoagulation and complete further imaging to allow definitive therapy. And now I'll pass it along to my colleagues. Well, there is a question here, a very difficult case uh, late in pregnancy with the possibility of pulmonary embolism. So Human, I want to ask you, give us a sense about the multidisciplinary pulmonary embolism response team or PERT. Give us a sense because this is a very dramatic situation at this point. Who do you call? Who gets involved here? Uh, yeah, so uh, as, as discussed here, uh, acute pulmonary embolism is a, uh, an acute process, a life-threatening process at times, uh, and the therapeutic interventions uh, that can be performed can be life-saving, um, but there are many different modalities that can be applied coming from many different disciplines. Uh, and back in the day, often the primary team that is caring for a patient may choose one of these uh, kind of uh, specialists to call upon. Uh, and they may, you know, offer or provide that therapy, uh, but at the end of the day, you want to choose the best therapy that's available. Uh, and um, ultimately, starting in about 2013, uh, these teams known as PERTs, these uh, multidisciplinary PE response teams that incorporate uh, specialists from, uh, mod um, you know, specialties that deal with the QPE, which include cardiology, pulmonary critical care, interventional radiology, cardiothoracic surgery, uh, hematology, emergency medicine, et cetera. Um, these are teams that um, meet very quickly uh, to discuss the case and provide a multidisciplinary recommendation and also uh, allow for uh, rapid mobilization of resources to properly care for these patients. Well, this it seems to me that this is a patient that uh, it may be getting into a shocky situation. And they, they, I'm going to get a question out of the blue uh, about what is the role of mechanical circulatory support uh, for this patient during delivery. And I would like uh, Greg to give, uh, at least to provide you, with us you, your expertise about this particular situation. Sure, Th thank you, Dr. Fuster. Um, so I, I definitely think mechanical support could be helpful in this situation if uh, she were to encounter extreme instability, refractory to medical management, or even cardiac arrest, which can happen with induction of anesthesia to facilitate the delivery. Uh, the preferred mechanical support device in this situation would be venoarterial ECMO. Uh, so part of the labor plan here needed to include how we would get this patient onto ECMO quickly if it was needed. Uh, and I think two things enable that. And one is being in a location that has the equipment necessary to do this and the personnel who are experienced in handling this situation, like a cardiac operating room, which is what we opted for here. Uh, and the second thing is, is having small bore vascular access uh, that can be rapidly exchanged for cannulas. The rate limiting step of establishing ECMO flow in an emergency 
is usually obtaining femoral arterial access. So having an existing arterial sheath in uh, can cut the time to ECMO by almost half. Excellent. Well, let's see what happened. Let's continue, Homan, see what you have. The case continues, and as Dr. Sera mentioned, uh, right femoral artery, right femoral vein, and left femoral vein access was placed for ECMO backup in case she were to decompensate. She became more tachypnic and short of breath, <clears throat> and she did in fact uh, have uh, drop her blood pressure, now 83 over 31, her heart rate still tachycardic at 151. Uh, she was in shock and was requiring significant uh, vasopressor and inotropic support with vasopressin, epinephrine, and milrinone. She uh, delivered a healthy baby vaginally uh, and did not require initiation of ECMO. I have a question, Greg, about this. Um, but you are ready for ECMO. The situation doesn't look great, at least at this time. Yeah, so we did have the access in ready for ECMO at this time, but you know, I, I, I think these numbers do, do a good job of summarizing a, a strong medical approach for right ventricular failure, which is inotropy with epinephrine and milrinone using vasopressin to offset the vasodilatation in order to keep a high enough MAP to maintain RV perfusion. And these doses are still at the level where there's room to escalate if needed. So continuing medical therapy here without mechanical circulatory support is still a safe plan. Uh, and luckily we were able to avoid the need for initiation of ECMO in this situation. Well, now I think we are reaching the diagnostic point if this is pulmonary embolism indeed, and we can now do CT angiography. We have a healthy baby and now is the time to proceed. So let's see the CT angiogram. And I'm going to ask uh, Chandra to, uh, to give us uh, the view of what he's seeing. Thank you, Dr. Fuster. This is indeed uh, a, a very complicated case, but you can start seeing that the pulmonary artery is dilated on the CT uh, and you can start seeing a start of an embolism in the right pulmonary artery and here in the left pulmonary artery. Uh, as you follow along, you can see the lower lobe vessels are completely clogged. There's hardly any dye going across. So essentially there's very little perfusion going down there. And if you look at the bottom of the screen on the left side of the screen, on the right lung and the periphery, you probably start seeing some start of infarcts there. And uh, if you remember, this used to be on the old X-rays called the Hampton sign, some equivalent of that. There are some blood vessels flowing to the anterior part of the lung, probably going up to the upper lobes. At this stage, I would hazard a guess that is what is keeping her perfusion to the lungs going. Uh, the remaining part of the lung is hardly perfused. These are not lung windows, so we can't exactly be sure, but that's how it seems to be. As we keep going, you start to see a big right heart, both the RA and RV. And as Julia had pointed out in the echo, the septum is bowed to the left, suggesting that uh, the pressure in the right heart is exceeding the pressure in the, in the left heart. And in the, on the echo, we already saw that this happens both in systole and diastole. So that is a significant elevation of pressure on the right side. And the right heart is not used to taking uh, high pressure. So it's uh, following the consequence and the right heart seems to have failed here. So it's, it's a tricky situation here. Signs of a major pulmonary embolism clogging both the main pulmonary artery branches. It seems to me, Chandra and Julia, <laughs> by looking at the echo, uh, things look pretty bad. Now that we know it's a pulmonary embolism, it seems to me that this is a very severe situation. And now looking at the uh, CT angiogram, uh, it seems that we are now finding this out. Is not correct, Chandra? It's, yeah. It's, it's a very dramatic issue here. Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. Uh, the team did suspect and react 
uh, without the imaging, uh, which is very creditable. Uh, and now uh, this shows that they were right. And now it raises the more important question. The story is not over. Now we have to take care of something major uh, at this stage. Uh, this is pretty serious. Well, I think now we have to ask uh, a number of experts what to do. This field has advanced so much. I still remember, you know, years ago, you wouldn't conceive to us that you could put a catheter and start getting clots out. Now things have changed. So here's my question, Robert, you now you are the expert. What percutaneous therapies could you offer to this patient? And how do you decide between the different modalities available today? Because it seems to me we don't have many options here other than going in this particular route. So, uh, Dr. Fuster, thank you for the question. Uh, and again, this, this is an absolutely fascinating case. And I was privileged uh, to be asked to participate in this patient's care. As you correctly stated, there have, there's been a revolution in the last five years of new technologies that have been approved by the US, the US Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of acute pulmonary embolism. One is the performance of catheter-directed lysis, where small catheters are placed into the pulmonary artery. And typically over eight to 12 hours, a low-dose fibrinolytic agent is used to dissolve the clot. Um, that's uh, been approved now for about five or six years. And then very recently, just in 2018 and 2019, two thrombectomy devices, percutaneous thrombectomy devices, have been studied and approved and also both published in JAK interventions uh, for the treatment of acute pulmonary embolism. The thrombectomy devices are designed for the acute debulking of the pulmonary arteries in an attempt in an emergency to uh, rescue the right ventricle uh, and acutely remove the thrombus, lower the right heart pressures and improve perfusion to not only the right side of the heart, but also again, decompress the right ventricular outflow track and improve the patient's hemodynamic status. So in this situation where as uh, Chandra and Julie have correctly stated, we have a high risk pulmonary embolism in a young patient who is requiring persistent vasopressor support, the uh, decision was made and this was decided with multiple uh, perspectives and multiple inputs from all key stakeholders that a acute thrombectomy procedure was ideally suited to rescue this patient that was facing impending cardiogenic shock. And so that's how we decided to uh, offer this therapy uh, to this patient and her family. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to hear more from you. So this is a, uh, a representation of this patient's procedure. And what you are seeing are the fluoroscopic images demonstrating the advancement of one of the uh, percutaneous thrombectomy devices. This device is called Flowtriever. It is a 24 French cannula that is introduced through the femoral vein. And as you can see in the panel on the uh, left, it is being used to deliver uh, the cannula to the uh, right middle and lower low pulmonary arteries. In the panel on the right is being delivered to the left lower low pulmonary artery. Uh, and at this point, once the catheter has been delivered, a manual aspiration maneuver is performed where thrombus as well as blood is extracted from the pulmonary artery and collected on the patient's uh, uh, table side. In this particular setting, when we catheterize the patient, both the left ventricular and the pulmonary artery pressures were over 55. Uh, the, the systolic pulmonary artery pressures were over 55, and the mean pulmonary artery pressure was over 35. And after just a few moments and extracting uh, somewhere between 100 and 150 milliliters of fresh 
acute thrombus from the patient's pulmonary arteries, we were able to reduce both the right ventricular pressure and the pulmonary artery pressures at the systolic level down to uh, between 30 and 35 millimeters of mercury. And we were able to reduce the mean pulmonary artery pressure down to below 25. So in terms of being able to acutely decompress the right ventricle and lower the pressures in the right ventricular outflow track, this procedure was specifically successful. Well, this is uh, excellent. Uh... I don't know if you have anything to add, but uh, now comes to mind, what about uh, an IBC filter here? Because certainly is a, a huge event, but this is a question that I'm sure all of us had at that time. Uh, so the, the questions regarding IBC filter platement are certainly controversial to say the least. And at least in 2022, um, the consensus uh, amongst our uh, uh, venous thromboembolism experts at Mount Sinai, and I think this is increasingly becoming the global consensus, is that unless there is an absolute contraindication to anticoagulation, an IVC filter is not necessary. Specifically, as it um, relates to uh, uh, either pregnant, actively pregnant patients or recently pregnant patients, it is typically not feasible to place an IVC filter below the renal veins. And so in this patient, if we were to explore placing an IVC filter, it would have to be placed above the renal veins in the retrohepatic uh, inferior vena cava. Um, the majority of the world's literature shows that placing filters in that location leads to greater complications, especially um, as it relates to uh, pregnant women. Um, and again, in this circumstance, having a multidisciplinary discussion, including uh, the uh, cardiology team, the interventional radiology team, the maternal fetal medicine team, we decided that this patient could tolerate a trial a parenteral anticoagulation, and that's how we decided to proceed with this patient's management. Okay, let's see what happened from here, Human. So as Dr. Luxstein discussed, a percutaneous thrombectomy was performed using the Inari flow retriever system, and she was uh, transferred to the uh, cardiac intensive care unit. The following day, she was still in shock. Um, she was requiring norepinephrine, vasopressin, and epinephrine at these doses. She did have a stable left labial hematoma. Well, first of all, before we go any further, uh, I think it's time to congratulate you, Robert, because the patient is still in a very vulnerable situation, but what you did was absolutely fantastic. And I just want to take this... Uh, I want to make this point and that this is wonderful to have people that can act very quickly in the way uh, you did, Robert. So let's continue with the case. Uh, here we have Chan uh, Chandra, this is now yours. Tell us what you think. Or maybe Julia, actually. Maybe Julia and Chandra. Go ahead, Julia. Um, thank you, Chandra. So I'll start and then uh, you can continue. So practically, uh, again, on the upper left side, we have the short axis that we see that the right heart is dilated. It's significantly impaired. I would say severely impaired. And also the left heart is completely squeezed. And again, we have a D-shape in end diastole and systole. Then uh, on the right, we have uh, the apical four-chamber view, slightly tilted. And we can see again that the right heart and the right ventricle and the right atrium are dilated. They are almost double the size when compared to the left heart, and um, also the tricuspid annulus is dilated. We expect a small degree of tricuspid regurgitation here, and just to mention that with a tricuspid regurgitation jet, we can measure the right ventricular systolic pressure. And then at the bottom, we have the um, uh, parasternal long axis view. That on the bottom, the bottom of the picture, we have the left heart, which is normal in shape and good in function, but on the at the upper part, we have the anterior part of the RV, which is dilated. 
and again it's uh, dysfunctional. So we have significant uh, significant systolic dysfunction of the right heart and significant dilatation. Nothing has changed. So we see similar picture to the first echo. So again, I would we would say that the pressures are quite high. What do you think, Chandra? Yeah, no, you, you you're right, Julia. Uh, what is fascinating to me is look at how bad the right heart is and how hyperdynamic and underfilled the left heart is. So this creates a very difficult situation for the people managing it. You, if you give them inotropes, you're going to essentially squeeze the left heart out with very low stroke volume. But uh, it's kind of a difficult thing. What you do for the right heart may adversely affect the left heart. So you're not surprised, Chandra, you're not surprised in, in Julia, you're not surprised the results from the procedure done by Robert were fascinating. And do you think the pressures are still high there? Or what are what are you thinking? The pulmonary artery pressures? I think so, the, the pressure on the septum doesn't seem to be, we don't have a good short axis view, but I don't see the, the septum being squished as much as into the left heart in systole. So I would say it certainly is, is down. I don't know how down. Part of the problem is when the RV is failing, the pressure will come down by itself because there isn't much stroke volume going from the right heart. Uh, but if I had to guess, the pressure would certainly be lower. It's not normal yet, uh, but it's certainly lower than before. Okay. Julia? I agree. Yeah, go and ahead. Also just to just to add that when we have acute right ventricular failure, there is a, a part of stunning of the right heart. So even when we treat the right heart, it needs hours or sometimes a couple of days in order to go back to normal size. And in patients with you know chronic thromboembolic disease and we have recurrent increase of pulmonary vascular resistance, then there will be a plateau that the right heart will start getting impaired. Here is the first time that's happening to this patient so I'm hoping that we had a normal RV to start with, and I'm hoping to see a normal RV after a couple of days. Thank you. Homan, can you continue? So the case continued, and um, given this concern that uh, we were unclear whether the right ventricular dilation and dysfunction was because of persistent clot and increased afterload versus the right ventricular dysfunction and dilation occurring because of the stunning, uh, we needed better um, kind of hemodynamics. And at this point in time, a PA catheter was placed uh, to further investigate this. And in fact, the pressures were quite normal. Uh, again, these were on significant amounts of vasopressors and inotropes. Uh, the CVP was normal at, at three. The PA pressures were normal, 26 over nine with a mean of 14. Uh, and she had a normal cardiac output and cardiac index an index of 3.4. Uh, the wedge pressure was not measured, but assuming that the wedge pressure uh, was less than the PA diastolic by some degree, uh, we could assume that the PVR, the pulmonary vascular resistance, was normal somewhere between uh, 0.7 and 1.3 Woods units. Um, because uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance was normal, uh, at this point in time, uh, it was decided to pursue a conservative management with respect to the pulmonary vasculature, no surgery, no thrombolysis, uh, and only anticoagulation to prevent uh, recurrence of uh, pulmonary embolism. On the second day after delivery, uh, she was extubated. Uh, on the fourth day, she was weaned off all vasopressors, and the following day was actually transferred out of the ICU to the floor. She did, though, have worsening bilateral labial hematomas. This is in the setting of therapeutic anticoagulation with intravenous heparin. She had received, in fact, 10 units of packed red blood cells over 10 days, uh, this kind of slow ooze over that time period. She had underwent two CT angiograms, uh, neither of them demonstrating uh, arterial blush or venous pooling, uh, and the uh, bilateral labial hematomas were quite large uh, in size. This is a um, demonstration of um, the, the hematoma. You can see here a very large um, labial hematoma. So here's a debate now. On one hand, a patient who had a thromboembolic disease, very significant, you did the right thing. You opened the arteries, the pulmonary arteries, pressures went down. 
And now you treat conservative with anticoagulants, but now you have a problem. You have a significant hemorrhage here. And I guess the question is, do you stop the anticoagulation and you put a filter? What, what do you do at this time? So uh, can you continue with the case? So as you mentioned, Dr. Fuster, um, because of the hemorrhage, the anticoagulation was stopped. And in fact, an IVC filter was placed because now we deemed her at this point in time to have a contraindication to anticoagulation as Dr. Luxine had mentioned. Um, on the ninth day, uh, she was noted to have some left upper extremity swelling, noted to have a non-occlusive left uh, IJ DVT. Uh, notably, that is where um, the SWAN, the PA catheter was placed. Uh, she also was found to have non-inclusive thrombi in the bilateral basilic veins. So at uh, two days later, um, heparin was restarted at a very low dose, essentially testing her to see whether uh, she would bleed, ultimately in the hopes of getting her to therapeutic anticoagulation. I have a question here. Uh, it seems you don't have faith on the IBC filter because a patient who is bleeding you put an IVC filter because you're worried about the thromboembolic aspect, but you still give heparin. Uh, Robert, what's the problem here? You put the IVC filter on one hand and you give heparin on another on a patient who is bleeding. Well, I, 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 I believe that this patient is demonstrating uh, a you know, prothrombotic state. Uh, they have thrombus in the jugular veins. Uh, which are obviously not uh, going to be protected by an inferior vena cava filter. They have thrombus in the uh, deep veins of the upper arm, uh, which again will not uh, be protected by an inferior vena cava filter. And I believe the concern at the time is that if the patient is clinically presenting as a prothrombotic state and is not able to be, be mobilized or, or to uh, be manipulated in, in any way that uh, initiating anticoagulation, if feasible, may prevent the patient from having uh, a more devastating thrombotic complication. Thank you. So your view is that you are dealing with a systemic problem here. That is correct. Yeah, I understand it. Can, okay. can I ask a question, Dr. Fuster? Uh, would, would a low-dose heparin be therapeutic at this time, or is it uh, with so much clot everywhere, would it uh, really do something, or should we have uh, just bite the bullet? Or It's a tough situation. I can, I can imagine the whole team sweating all the time. This, there's no relief here, one after the other. Well, actually, the team was sweating, and you will see this in the next few minutes. <laughs> because you have a systemic problem and you give, you know, low dose heparin. If you really are concerned about the systemic uh, thrombotic phenomena, low dose heparin is will not going to make it. Right. The problem is the patient is bleeding at the same time. And what is going on is really was, was part of the, of the situation in this patient that made uh, <laughs> the lives of both of those involved very difficult. So maybe I, I can answer your question. Say, low dose heparin certainly cannot take care of these clots. Right. So I like to see what happened. Uh, so Human, go on. So the very next day after starting the low dose heparin, another rapid response team was called for acute dyspnea, hypoxemia and tachycardia. At this point, her blood pressure is normal, 128 over 81. She's tachycardic, uh, but not as much so, 107, and her oxygen saturation is 89% on room air. There was a concern again for uh, pulmonary embolism and a CTA chest was performed. Okay, Chandra. Okay, let's go. Oh, okay, that is the old thrombus still there in the left pulmonary artery. And now we have a new actor here. There's a big saddle thrombus, which is new. It's extending across the bifurcation into both arteries. Uh, that's bad news again. One good part is the pulmonary artery. If you remember, the right pulmonary artery was completely clogged and it's now perfusing. Dye is going past the, the clot. So that's the good news. The bad news is the pul new 
saddle embolism. The peripheral infarcts are kind of disappearing, uh, but uh, the other part of the good news is the peripheral arteries are starting to perfuse, as you can see in both right and left side of the lungs. So it's a mixture of good news and a really concerning uh, saddle embolus. Uh, just after a major heroic effort to get rid of the clot in the first place a few days ago. And then the RV is not as uh, much a pressure effect like before. Part of it also could be now the LV pressures are in the 120s, so the RV pressures are coming down, so the septum is not as much bowed as before. The RV is still big. Uh, we can talk about the function, but I would suppose it's still stunned and uh, hypocontractile. Yeah. So, big problem. Recurrent pulmonary embolism, despite anticoagulation and the placement of an IVC filter. So, Julia, what is going on? What is your thinking here? Team, the team must be sweating, as you said before. So, it's very challenging. You know, recurrent P, the patient is quite sick. She's a young mother. And uh, we have to decide what's the appropriate anticoagulation. So, maybe I don't know what ask, happened. We, maybe we can ask home and what happened there. As, as you, Julia, you are thinking. I think some of the concerns we had at the time were, um, you know, we did do the low dose heparin at that time, mainly to test for the sake of uh, bleeding, but again, we're not therapeutically anticoagulating. So she, uh, you know, may have a supreme thrombotic state uh, that is not being uh, accounted for by the anticoagulation. Additionally, um, it's important to note that IVC filters, while they do protect from DVTs from below, uh, they are devices sitting in your vascular system, and in fact, are prothrombotic themselves. And it's not uncommon to form a filter, uh, a clot on top of the. Uh, IVC filter and, and thus uh, throw it from that. And in fact, um, the pre-PIC2 study where uh, patients were randomized to IVC filters or not in the setting of anticoagulation, uh, there was no difference between rates of PE at three and six months, but there was actually a trend towards more PEs in the IVC filter group. And then finally, there are some very, very, very prothrombotic states uh, that could be uh, in play, including antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, uh, COVID, obviously, uh, nowadays, um, and then uh, especially with the timing of heparin literally the day before, uh, the concern for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Okay. So tell us what happened. So uh, heparin was bolused, uh, given the concern that she had this, uh, you know, large PE and she was not actually on therapeutic uh, anticoagulation. Uh, and the heparin rate was increased to achieve therapeutic anticoagulation. She was then very quickly transferred to the ICU again. Uh, a repeat CBC three hours later demonstrated that her platelets actually were a tiny bit lower than before. Uh, they had been about 185, down to 145, down to 120 in a span of 30 hours. Um, and given this concern about uh, forming a clot uh, despite some degree of anticoagulation and an IVC filter uh, in the setting of recent uh, reinitiation of heparin with this dropping of platelets, there was this concern for HIT, uh, heparin-induced um, thrombocytopenia. And so she was empirically switched to Argatrobin. Um, somehow, later that day, uh, she was also diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, seemingly contracted while she was in the hospital. The following day, uh, her HIT antibody was actually positive, and uh, a few days later, this was confirmed with the serotonin release assay as positive for HIT. Well, um, here we have an issue uh, in what to do. What are the options for anticoagulation in this patient who is both postpartum and has HIT? Uh, Julie, I go back to you. 
you are the expert. First of all, uh, it's important to understand, you know, postpartum if the patient would like to breastfeed or not. And so I understand that the patient has heat. So again, um, low molecular heparin, which is the gold standard for lactation, um, is not, we cannot use it here. And um, then we have to discuss other options that they may be risky for lactation, but we understand that the patient has heat, so we need to protect here. So like the new anticoagulants. So I would be very interested to find out what the team suggested to the patient and also most important, whether the patient would like to breastfeed or not. Okay, uh, what happened, uh, Human? So the case continued. Um, she continued to slowly improve. She ultimately was transitioned to a Pixaban. Uh, she decided at that point in time that she was not going to breastfeed. She was discharged home on um, post delivery day 24. And three months later, uh, this is her echocardiogram. Okay, Julia, what, what do you see here? And this is a normal echocardiogram. The right heart has gone back to normal size. We can see that's one third of the left ventricle. So on the first on, on the first uh, slide, which is on the upper left, we see the parasternal long axis. And it's, uh, we have a right ventricle that's normal in size, normal in function. It has recovered fully. Then on the upper right side, we have the short axis that we see that the right heart is almost one third, one um, second of the left heart. So the left heart, you see how beautifully it expands at the level of papillary muscles. And now what we call left ventricular eccentricity index is equal to one in end systole and end diastole. That means that there is no pressure or volume overload. And then at the bottom, we have the apical four chamber view that we have a normal right ventricle, normal right atrium. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that this ventricle went back to normal. Just a, a, a note that the right ventricle has one sixth of the mass of the left ventricle. So in acute pressure overload, it will dilate and then with therapy, then it will go back to normal when the pulmonary vascular resistance, of course, is normal as we saw with invasive hemodynamics. So I'm very happy with the patient that she has a normal right ventricle. Well, it's an amazing case though. Uh... Uh, thromboembolism very severe at the end of pregnancy what to do and it seems to me the right thing was done that is to open uh, percutaneously the pulmonary arteries and and things appear to be to be great and it was a great result and then we we end up with a problem of thromboembolism and and hemorrhage and then the question is the uh, the patient has COVID and on top has heat, and which is the best way to do is to be conservative at that time. And Argatrovan, I think, was the one, or Pixavan was the one was given. But certainly a very complex case. So uh, what is next, Homer? Uh, this is not her, <laughs> but uh, I do want to say, actually, I did see her in clinic yesterday, uh, and she's doing wonderfully well. Um, with, uh, she is very fatigued because she's not sleeping because of her baby. Um, but, um, she's running around and doing excellent. Well, this is fantastic. So tell us, uh, since you were very involved with the case and you made the basic presentation, what do you think are the take home? So the key takeaways from this case, um, I think to, to have a plan for backup mechanical circulatory support when delivering in the setting of uh, pulmonary embolism, especially big ones. Um, that percutaneous thrombectomy is safe and effective even in situations of hemodynamic instability and massive PE, high-risk PE. And one should always consider heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with a clotting event despite therapeutic heparin. Well, this is excellent. Uh, what I would like to ask now each of you, what did you learn from the case or what do you think uh, would be something that motivated you for future understanding of situations like this? So I'd like to start with you, Chandra. Chandra, what, what is your feeling after being uh, seeing a case like this? 
Wow, I, I'm I'm really impressed at the way the team managed this. I mean, they couldn't get a break, a problem after problem, and poor patient. Congratulations, this is fantastic. What it taught me is uh, in in young healthy patients, when many things go wrong, as long as the substrate is strong, you can recover and you should not give up and keep doing what is needed. The other thing I have to still go back and think is there is always this story that the right heart, when it acutely faces pressure overload, it gives up and by about 40 millimeters of mercury or so it will fail and it cannot generate high pressures. But Dr. Lukstein told us he had pressures in the upper 50s, 60s when he did the, did the catheterization. So there is a high amount of variability, how much a failing RV can generate as pressure uh, that I find is fascinating. Uh, so thank you, congratulations. This is an amazing case. That's a great case. Uh, Greg, what did you get from the case? I, I think just underscores the importance of a, a team-based approach for the critically ill patients. You know, having a, a multidisciplinary input here made a, a huge difference, not just in, uh, you know, the procedures that were able to be done, but in the, in the medical decisions that were able to be made. And I think in the absence of really any, any one member of that team, uh, it, it would not have gone as smoothly and maybe the outcome wouldn't have been the same. So I think it's really important. Greg, have you used ECMO in any of these patients with pulmonary embolism? Yeah, we, we definitely have. I, I see Dr. Lookstein shaking his head. You know, often we, we, we do it in conjunction with Dr. Lookstein uh, while, while they're performing in a procedure. And uh, it, it is a very effective therapy, but it's, it's a very high risk therapy that carries a lot of side effects and, um, uh, you know, possible complications. So we, we definitely try and reserve it. And when it's not needed, which fortunately in this case it wasn't, uh, but it, it is an effective tool when it is, when it is truly needed. Thank you. Julia? So I would like to congratulate, you know, the team. And that was a very challenging case. Every step is time sensitive. We are talking about a young mother. And, um, you know, she wants to enjoy her, her baby. So she, you don't want to have a young lady with a right side heart failure. So great level of teamwork. Congratulations to everybody. And um, just uh, as an echo lover, you know, how we follow up these patients with echo to make sure that the right ventricle regresses, goes back to normal. So it's impressive. This is the magic of the right heart that can dilate and then effectively can go back to normal with appropriate treatment. Congratulations again. Thank you, Julia. Robert? Uh, I will, uh, I would echo uh, uh Dr. Sarau's uh, sentiment in that we are we are very privileged here at Mount Sinai to have a, a wonderful multidisciplinary team where we all respect each other's viewpoints and expertise. And this is a great example of a, a true multidisciplinary team coming together to uh, come up with a plan with multiple levels of backup to rescue this acutely ill woman and make sure that despite all the challenges that we faced over the course of her hospital stay, that we had appropriate input and appropriate expertise so that she could be managed in a timely manner, resulting in such a wonderful outcome uh, for this young woman and her child. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. I feel the same. Thank you. Puman? Uh, honestly, I, I I think the most important takeaway has been has been said over and over again about the multidisciplinary team, uh, and I, I, I can't stress enough the importance of, of this team and also um, that the team has been working together for a very long time, and it's a small group of people who are very comfortable with each other, uh, and we trust each other, and we know exactly how each operate, um, and I think you know we've had many 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 dry runs on much less challenging cases. Uh, and so uh, there was very little room for error here. And I think every single person in, in this team um, played their role, you know, um, perfectly well, uh, you know, to provide this uh, excellent outcome that ultimately happened. Yeah, I, thank you very much. Uh, I just have two comments. It's fascinating how in the last, uh, I would say five years, actually, the team, uh, the team effort, uh, 
how many uh, how much benefit is really these teams are having in in our patient care you know we can talk about the patient of today we have patients of different types and but what i would say to you is that based in my experience this team approach has unified people and has unified departments have unified groups and to me this concept that now beginning to have an integration of medicine in terms of all of us who participate to me is a fantastic movement a great movement uh, in medicine and then the second issue of course in, in a case like this I cannot get away from the picture of a mother and the child like nothing happened. I mean, this is, this is something that is a, is a good message to carry home. And that is, as desperate a situation is, maybe today we have the tools and we have the people and we can have miracles like the one that we have seen today. So I want to take this opportunity, of course, to, uh, to thank all of you for participating in this hour discussion. I think we all learned something. Uh, and again, uh, it's wonderful uh, to be also working uh, for the American College of Cardiology and Jack, the General American College of Cardiology, who has been able to put this together and, and to make us to be quite pleased and quite happy and quite proud. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.